So we want to start every episode um, getting to the heart of it straight away. I think we all know you as Ella from Deliciously Ella, but who is Ella Mills? Let's start there. It's funny because I wrote that question this weekend and I hadn't quite thought about answering it yeah. myself. Um, so I do feel in a, in a hot seat right now. I think I'm really working it out is the honest answer. I think that's probably why I don't have the answer is that I think it's been a strange, amazing life, but a strange life in lots of ways, which is that I think I was just trying to understand who I was Mm -hmm. at the point in which I got ill and then Delicious Yellow took over my life and then I became a mum. And I feel now only in the last like six months or so I'm really figuring out exactly who I am what I want and I think what I've really realized within that is I'm actually a complete introvert my dream is just being at home um I'm really antisocial I think in reality but I desperately crave a sense of mission a sense of purpose I get bored very easily and I think that's what I really want to achieve in my life and I think I'm feeling that more and more yeah that's so interesting it's so interesting that I mean, it's been 10 years of Deliciously Ella now, hasn't it? And considering you're saying that you're such an introvert, but actually you've been the face of this huge brand that exploded as social media was exploding. It's just, it's such an interesting dichotomy. It's so interesting. And I think because everything's moved at the most extreme pace, it feels like we've been living. It's like when you're watching TV and you do Mm. times 30, it feels like we've been living on times 30. And I think within that, you kind of become what everyone wants you to be in some ways. Not that I didn't want to be it, but I don't think I took a a huge amount of time to figure out me, Ella, as a person, also as an individual, because my husband, Matthew, if anyone doesn't know, um, we met and then we started working together about six weeks later. We were married about nine months later. And so I think it was also almost like, who am I? still very much in the partnership but I think because we started the business together and everything was so intense it's almost what do I want to get out of the business what do I want to get out of my every single day Mm. and remembering I'm also my own person 100% so you're deliciously Ella you're a wife you're a mum but actually who are you who's Ella exactly and I think because of the intensity of everything personally and professionally Mm. I feel like now early 30s I'm actually just starting to understand it completely so diving into today how are you today yeah and I so want our guests to answer this honestly so I'm, I'll answer it honestly I'm okay I feel like I've had a really good few months and on this self-development journey I've really been on taking so much inspiration from last season's guests but I've been a bit of a kind of anxious wreck actually <laughs> the last few days um this time of year it's early December it's always quite overwhelming isn't it I think for everyone there's this like a intense professional rush to get everything finished before Christmas and for us January is kind of the busiest time of the year Mm. and then also yeah life with a two-year-old and a three-year-old sometimes it's the most enriching thing in the world and sometimes it can be quite overwhelming yeah absolutely a hundred percent I think it's that summer to Christmas period it feels quite intense for everyone I think there's an energy about this time of year which is an exciting energy because everyone's looking forward to Christmas and getting their tree and sorting out family plans but at the same time I think there is quite a lot of pressure to make sure you're getting everything right wrapping everything up at work seeing all of your friends before the end of the year worrying about what's to come next year what does January look like and it's a lot there's there's a lot going on exactly so you've spoken quite openly about your health journey and how that led you to founding Deliciously Ella and the last 10 years. But actually going back to the beginning, where did it all start? How were you feeling at the time? And talk us through what happened there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so what we want, isn't it, with this series to understand like what is the catalyst that changes our life? And I think it's obviously different, isn't it, on everybody. And for some people, it's a massive catalyst. And for other people, it might be a series of smaller events. But I think we all deeply relate to that don't we which is that there's always things that happen either to us or around us that have Mm. such a fundamental impact on our lives and it's a moment to kind of potentially regroup maybe you're made to maybe it's something that you decide you need to do on the way you're living your life and is that how you want to live it and I think mine came about really accidentally which is obviously when I when I got ill back in 2011 and you know I know people will have 
heard that story before and and so I'll, I'll give it to you briefly but kind of don't worry this whole episode will tell you lots of things you've never heard before as well um but I going back to the question earlier of how how am I feeling I I feel I'd been at university for two years at this point and I think to be totally frank kind of prior to that I really hadn't been very happy I really couldn't figure out who I was what I wanted to be kind of where my place was had a relatively complicated family and um I just was quite lost and I was especially in my kind of teenage years and my later teenage years I was really unhappy and I didn't really make many friends at school and especially in my second school and I always felt quite out of place and I'd gone to university and I'd had two years there and I was so happy I really figured really felt I was enjoying myself and knew who I was and then this illness came out of completely nowhere really and I felt like it kind of set me back a hundred years in so many ways and I spent all of the rest of 2011 into 2012 just kind of in a hole um and I think it took me a really really long time to take ownership of that and of the challenge but I my autonomic nervous system stopped working properly and I, I couldn't control basically any of my bodily functions from heart rate digestion circulation immune system um chronic fatigue brain fog kind of bit of everything but also so my mental health I think was also so much worse than I realized and obviously conversations around mental health as well as physical health have obviously moved on no end in in the last decade but I think at the time you know I remember my dad saying to me you know I think you're also depressed you should go and talk to someone and I found that really difficult thing to hear and I really didn't want to take any ownership of that but when I look back on it I was kind of catatonically depressed you know I I didn't really even care anymore if I woke up the next day um wow which but I I didn't talk about that was one of the things I I was I would talk about the physical symptoms but not to anyone outside of my family Mm -hmm. you know when I got first got ill I sent a Facebook message to my which is quite in retrospect probably wasn't the best way to talk to people about it but I sent a Facebook message to my three flatmates at the time and I said that this is why I've been really quiet the last few months this is what's happened this is what I've got I sent them a link to a website that kind of explained the illness. And I think, I I wish I could redo the message because I think I delivered it in such a strange way, but I really didn't get much response. And as someone who'd always been quite insecure, as I said, I wasn't very happy beforehand. And I think that was because I was really actually had incredibly low self-esteem and and did feel incredibly insecure. And I think that really just like exacerbated the fact that I felt something was wrong with me and that people wouldn't like me and maybe they didn't like me already. But now that I was strange and different and alien because I had this all these conditions and I couldn't do all these normal things as a result that no one would want to be my friend. And I took their response to that message as like concrete evidence that everybody would feel the same way about me. Um, As I said, that's not just on them. That's very much on me as well. But at the time, I really couldn't see that and it was my nervousness in talking about it that I think created the situation but I literally didn't speak to anyone pretty much for almost a year my goodness it's such a tough situation I think that period of anyone's life is quite a vulnerable period you're coming out of teenhood into your early 20s you're really figuring out who you are what you stand for what you want to do who you are as a friend who you are as an individual and then to have that layer on top as well just makes it all the harder and I think as well there's an element of when you talk about your friends not responding or not knowing it's it's also the same situation for them they're still maturing and learning who they are and then when they're confronted with something that is a tough conversation to have it's understandable that they didn't know how to react to but then you're in this sort of catalyst of that then impacts how you feel which makes the whole situation worse but it's just it's you know it's completely understandable on on both sides what a tough situation completely and I wish I could kind of go back and redo it I know that's not a helpful way to live your life but I think if I'd approached it differently they would have approached it differently and that's been I guess one of my big learnings over the last 10 years is taking a lot more responsibility for how you feel and your actions and stopping seeing how other people respond to you as a way of defining you or how you kind of act and show up every day absolutely but I just didn't have the emotional bandwidth at that point and I think I felt so broken anyway that I just I didn't really know where to go with it yeah absolutely and and you can say that now because you've got the hindsight of 
10 years of developing and maturing and learning but I think there's a, a piece of compassion as well for your younger self that's you just did the best you could exactly. with the situation you had it's so hard so so talk more about that journey to your diagnosis how long did that take um what was that like and how did you feel at the time when you got that diagnosis you finally got an answer yeah that was a really strange period because I think I really kind of doubted myself in so many ways I had so I spent it's really a kind of four month period at the beginning seeing goodness knows how many different consultants endocrinologists neurologists gastroenterologists had lots of MRI scans and colonoscopies and endoscopies and cystoscopies and oh literally you name it I did it I swallowed cameras um the longest I spent in hospital was 10 days and no one could get to the bottom of what was wrong and it got to the point that like any strange illness under the sun was being kind of tossed around as potential and getting a test for that and and the next thing but I mean there was even a point where there was a question of like am I allergic to all food because it had got so bad that it was literally having a reaction to kind of everything and but equally because we couldn't get to the bottom of anything and no one knew what it was you do I think also have that sense of kind of really doubting yourself and the way you talk about it and I think it was a really difficult time for my family as well because you know I I wasn't very good at articulating how I really felt and what was really going on and yet they're there and they're trying to support you but they don't really know how to support you and they don't really know what's going on and is it permanent is it fixable and when I got my diagnosis I was so happy which because I think it confirmed the fact that I wasn't, you know, for once better were going mad, you know, there really were all these physical things happening and this is why they were happening and this is what the problem was. And there was a name for it. But then I just felt that it was going to be like when you're little and you get tonsillitis and you get given antibiotics mm-hmm. and then um, you take your antibiotics and you're so much better. And I didn't think it would be quite as quick as that. You know, I didn't think it would be like a 72 hour period, but I I did assume, and I was told I'd probably be on this medication for the rest of my life. It was a chronic illness. Um, and I was kind of okay with that facet of it, but I just assumed that the medication would control everything and I could just kind of forget about this period of my life and, and go back to how I'd been living before. Um, and then it was, wasn't until almost like, six months or so later when I cycled through all the available repurposed medications for the condition and they didn't really work Mm -hmm. and some of them had created certain side effects that were making other things worse or created new symptoms that was when I actually when things actually got really really bad in terms especially within my mental health because it was a sense of becoming kind of incredibly apathetic because it just didn't really understand how there could be a way forward and I remember so clearly I was back at trying to go back to university at this point which I don't know in retrospect was a good idea or a bad idea it made me feel a lot more alienated because it was so clear the fact that I wasn't partaking in kind of normal activities but equally maybe it would have got worse if I'd been if I'd completely given up to an extent but I remember being on the phone to one of my doctors and I just tried the last medication that, that he had available and it hadn't worked and one of the main symptoms that I had that really affected me was really chronic um, stomach problems I looked like I was about seven or eight months pregnant and all the time and I um and we there was a medication that was hopefully helped that but but it hadn't and I just remember so clearly like literally lying on my university bedroom floor like hysterical completely hysterical on this realization like there was there was nothing left and and was this basically my life now and I just couldn't really figure out how that would look or what I was going to do um but I didn't act on that for quite a long time I just kind of um that I think that was when I felt like I really gave up and it was a few months of that of just not partaking really in anything and not talking about it in just watching a lot of tv shows and just kind of pretending 
numbing yeah numbing exactly yeah. completely numbing out and I used to eat so much like pick a mix and it would make my heart palpitations so much worse but at this point it was like I just don't care I'm so ill I can't do anything why not make it worse yeah which I think ultimately you went through a trauma like that whole experience is traumatic and numbing is a very natural part of the management process once you suffer a trauma or when you suffer a trauma so it's absolutely I think to be expected but going from there which sounds like maybe that was really your rock bottom what was the journey to starting to play with your diet and and test foods and what did that look like and and kind of what made you decide to to examine your diet in the first place because I think you know even now but even more so 10 years ago diet isn't explored enough as a healing property I think I think we can say that in in modern medicine Um, so what made you turn to that route and and how did you find it google Uh, (laughs) um best doctor around no I'm joking It's, it's not but no yeah no one had put forward any other options and I'd it came about actually because I feel like I was really hanging around my rock bottom which in a way is sometimes a good place to get to because sometimes you're lucky enough to have that as a catalyst to change things but um maybe I needed to get there but I I tried to do my first kind of normal thing in a while and and I had an amazing boyfriend at the time he was so supportive and you know he really was incredible throughout the whole thing and we decided to try and do a weekend away together and while we were away I ended up getting just a normal like tummy bug or something but it ended up making me so ill that I came home in a wheelchair and I just yeah it just it was this realization that I tried to do something kind of very run on the mill and the trip the rest of the trip was cancelled and he brought me home in a wheelchair and we kind of tried to find the funny side at the time and a bit of it was funny but a bit of it was like hang on a second he's such a good guy but he's not going to stay in this relationship and how am I ever going to do anything normal ever again and actually I think it was a week or so before that I'd had just another test I had these chronic um, urinary tract infections and they were causing a few problems because they'd been um, so chronic and I had to have a cystoscopy which is a camera in your bladder to look at scarring and things and I'd had an allergic reaction they actually think to a plaster Wow. Yeah, where where um, the anaesthetic had gone in. Um, I think it was an anaesthetic. Anyway, um, and my heart rate had gone so low. It was in the 40s and I couldn't go back up after the, you know, it's a very, very small, quick procedure. And my body was just so weak that it couldn't handle that at that point, as I said, some kind of reaction that made my heart feel like it was going to keep beating from potentially a plaster. And I think it was just the kind of realisation that, I just couldn't stay where I was anymore. And so I I came home from this trip back to my mom. And it's something, it's it's not not embarrassing, but I was, it almost felt for want of a better word, embarrassing that I'd like try to be a kind of semi grown up and do a trip with my boyfriend to be wheeled home to my mom. Yeah. You know, it's just- The psychological impact of that must have been huge when you're a woman in her early twenties and you've already gone through months and months of these health yeah issues and you've have... got no independence yeah completely so it sounds like you actually had a few rock bottoms in your journey to feeling better and getting better I think the big question is how did you find food why did you look at nutrition because I think we can all agree that nutrition probably isn't looked at in the capacity that it it probably should be and within modern medicine we often look to medications and other quick fixes before we look at our nutrition and what we're consuming so what made you land on that and what was that experience so it was the night that I got home from this disastrous trip with my then boyfriend and it was the it was just the penny dropping moment which is that it wasn't that I didn't know I was in such a bad place but I didn't want to admit to myself that I was in a bad place it's like I said earlier when my dad said I think you're very depressed and even though I knew that I was lying there and we lived next to a um uh train station and see the trains from my room and I do remember lying there and just being like I just wouldn't care if I was lying in the tracks and I wasn't about to do something and I I say that with like real understanding that this is a very emotive topic Mm. but I I didn't care anymore I really 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 didn't care 
And, but I, I just couldn't admit that to myself. I couldn't admit how ill I was. I just couldn't, I don't know. I just struggled so much to, to own it basically. And it was that night where I think because I, it was because I hadn't, because I couldn't admit it, I just hid from it. The numbing out we were talking about earlier. I didn't talk to people. I didn't try and go out. I just watched TV at home. I didn't, I didn't put myself in situations that would almost be hard. Mm. And so it was the first time in doing this trip that I'd almost tried to actually do something and actually live my life in a year. And in doing that, I realized I couldn't. I really couldn't and it was kind of screaming the obvious and so I couldn't I couldn't sleep at all that night and I was just um it had, everything that had happened had dawned on me you know like trying to have Sunday lunch and ending up sleeping for like three hours on a chair next to everyone having lunch because I just was that like the chronic fatigue was that bad that I could just pass out in the middle of nowhere like my mum used to joke about being in the car with me and I'd go to sleep and she could just stop the car and do a Sainsbury shop and get back in and and I wouldn't even wake up like it and I I just hadn't really admitted that that's what it was and I just I realized how bad it was that night and that I was never going to live the life that I wanted to live and to be fair I didn't know what life I wanted to live either um who I wanted to be what I wanted to do it's not like I had this really clear career plan or life plan um, but I just knew that anything that I thought I maybe could have done in the future wasn't going to happen if I stayed on that current trajectory. And I, I just went to Google and I was Googling natural healing, alternative healing, people healing from chronic diseases, kind of anything under that iteration. And I came across all sorts of different people who'd had all sorts of different conditions, all of whom had used facets of changing their diets and that's what's really looking at at the time elements of their lifestyle but it's really focused on diet at this point it was really focused on the physical healing and I was so inspired by their stories and I just felt I had quite literally nothing to lose why not try it so the next morning I said to my mum I'm actually going to become like completely natural fully plant-based only eat whole foods etc etc and she sort of looked at me like what (laughs) where is this coming from who are you as someone that especially like loved pick a mix and all those sorts of things didn't like cooking was not a big vegetable eater um wasn't really particularly interested in food she was quite kind of confused and taken aback by it but you know all credit to her she'd been so supportive throughout this whole period and she said okay let's try it I'll do it with you um and she was like I'll I'll eat everything you're gonna eat um that's incredible and also a huge support good for her because it was really gross to start with as well (laughs) (laughs) so that's even more support which is that it's the meals did not taste good in day one pre the feel better app (laughs) this is pre the i needed the feel better app yeah no honestly the food was awful um and um and she tried and she ate everything with me and she was she was kind of gentle in some feedback in that like um this isn't brilliant (laughs) had nicer food um but she was so so supportive and we started doing it together and um which really helped I think that that sense of like absolute someone having your back is kind of the greatest gift in the world and I'm still kind of eternally grateful to her for that I really don't think Delicious Ciela would it wouldn't be what it is today without a huge number of people but I don't know if it would exist if it wasn't for her Mm. That's incredible. I think especially you're at your low point at this point as well. So to turn that around and say, okay, I'm going to try and completely switch up my lifestyle and try something entirely different to have her as a support must have just been so important. So Mm, it was hats off to your mum. Yeah, (laughs) she was a complete anchor. She really, really was. And like she read every single recipe post, absolutely everything first follower on Instagram probably and um she was absolutely brilliant and then um but it was an and then it was a girlfriend of mine who said you know you should do it as a a blog you should write it you should write it down and she set up a WordPress site for me and everything so she and she played a massive role in it as well so it was kind of really really two-pronged and I think that support was important but interestingly I was um you know, as I said, self-esteem definitely wasn't my kind of strongest point growing up. And it had hit such a 
new low at this point. I was so embarrassed about what I was doing. I really didn't want people to know. I didn't want to talk about it. I just wanted to be quite invisible, which feels so ironic given where this has all ended up. But I, um, I wouldn't show anyone. And I said, you know, if I hit 10,000 hits on the website, then I'll, then I'll show you. And this was kind of like to my sister and um, like one or two other people. And um, anyway, and then I got, it was about three months later um, that it got 10,000. Um, I think it was pretty much on my 21st birthday. And um, so I had to show it to people, which was, like almost one of the most daunting moments in my career which is quite funny because it was still so tiny and it was just you know my closest people but I was still yeah I think I was so kind of nervous of what people would think and it's that jumping off a cliff moment though isn't it it's like okay now I'm fully doing this and there's no going back once you show people so it really is that moment of truth which is yeah it's it's hard to take I think it's a brave move it's you know what it's exactly that it's when you say it out loud I am doing this, this is, you know, but equally, and the more I've learned as well about, you know, the impact that our mindset has on our mental health, but interestingly on our physical health, the more I feel actually truly finding that sense of purpose and that focus probably really helped the physical aspect of getting better in lots of ways as well. I really, I really do believe that, you know, that impact of mindset is, is so fundamental. And it was so interesting because I felt, so unempowered for so so long and even the day I cooked my first recipe it's not like the first recipe changed anything in terms of like the physical mental symptoms but I felt like a different person because I was like I am doing this I am doing something that's helping me you know I remember eating so really simple like sweet potato and avocado salad but I remember eating it and being like this is good for me this is going to make a difference in my life. And actually I still use that mindset now, you know, I was in a bit of a kind of funk this weekend. And on Sunday morning, I was like, I don't want to feel like this anymore. Right. I'm going to make something really healthy for myself. And it's amazing that act of just, it's just one thing. It can be so simple, but I think it has such a massive impact on your mindset and your sense of empowerment and that you can do it and your motivation and positivity. And I think that ripple effect I don't know if I realised how big it was at the time, but um, but it felt huge. And I remember writing the bio for Delicious Ciela and I wrote on it, I think it's probably still in some iteration on our website, you know, if I can take my negative and turn it into a positive for one more person, then this whole experience could potentially be a success. And I think, again, it was that reframing of the situation that made such a huge difference. Absolutely. And I think it's important to note as well that this is 10 years ago, at a time where Goop wasn't the brand that it is today and the conversations around gut health, wellness and mind-body connection and the conversations around even mental health and mental well-being weren't being had so openly at that time. So it's so interesting to hear your journey of learning about that almost indirectly through the physical symptoms that you were having and the physical illness that you had. So it's... it it's proof is in the pudding isn't it that there's that connection between the mind and and the body oh totally and everyone thought I was nuts like really because as you said it wasn't part of a mainstream conversation and there wasn't kind of easy access to understand you know podcasts weren't a medium then now if you want to listen to a podcast about your diet impacting either your mental or physical health you can listen to our show but you could listen to goodness knows how many thousands if not tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of episodes or go on youtube or go on instagram or read any mainstream media or broadcast and iterations of this conversation will pop up and whereas it 10 11 years ago that that just wasn't the case and you know remember my brother my brother is so bright he's so clever and him sort of saying you know what you eat it's not gonna make any difference like everything's just a chemical it doesn't matter what kind of chemical it is and because it wasn't part of this narrative. And I was like, no, it will make a difference. Trust me, one day people will be talking about the fact that emulsifiers aren't good for you. And he sort of just rolled his eyes at me. And um, yeah, it was just, everyone I know thought I was mad. And I remember the first time again, like trying to be sociable again, trying to kind of take baby steps. And he went to a dinner party and I took a little Tupperware box with like some little lentil salad in it. Because again, like it was just so alien that, to people. And I remember sitting there and someone saying, so you've bought a packed lunch and you're not drinking. 
you're probably the funniest person here, aren't you? Oh. And thinking like, oh, I'm trying so hard. Um, but gradually kind of, I think it became, yeah, more and more accepted. Um, Would you say that was one of the biggest challenges of the whole experience of is realizing that you couldn't do things quote unquote the normal way or you you weren't you know the same as everyone else that you had to prioritize different things like do you think that was one of the hardest parts about the whole journey yeah I think that was probably in many ways and I also think that's probably had the longest lasting impact and I think in some ways I still kind of feel facets of that now because whilst the conditions like very much under control we don't feel it on a day-to-day basis I don't feel I can live kind of quote unquote normally whatever normally really means but um you know I'll still get heart palpitations if I do x y or z or I'll still kind of feel facets of it creep back in if I'm not taking care of myself so I do you know I remember going on like my first hen party I just can't stay out as late I can't do exactly what everyone else can do and it took I think finding things I really enjoyed and a sense of community within that was really really important but still feeling like you were living a little bit differently and then also because work was such a different thing you know I think lots of people in their early 20s socializing having fun is still kind of priority number one and it wasn't, it wasn't really on my to-do list because it wasn't very plausible, the kind of conventional fun that a lot of people were having at that point. But then also because Delicious Yellow exploded so quickly, you know, when I was sort of 23, 24, it ended up being a kind of 24-7 responsibility from such a early age that, again, I think that made me feel a tiny bit different. You know, Matthew and I started the kind of more business side of the business early 2015, so it was... 23 turning 24 and was still so young and suddenly we had all these massive responsibilities people to pay every single month you know times where you think you're about to go bust the next day and we really you know really did have a few times where it was like an absolute scramble not to go bust the next week and so it's just a really different sense of life Mm. um and I think that coupled with being ill but then also the pressure of people thinking because delicious yellow exploded so quickly you know saying at the beginning that like, you know feeling this pressure of kind of being what people want you to be you know is again in my very early 20s people were like a guru I was so many things I am so many things I'm not a guru never have been never will be um and people think that you know all the answers but you're really figuring so much out yourself and I was figuring out so much myself in terms of just the knowledge of this industry and of your body and your brain but I was also figuring out so much about who I was and so it was quite a kind of yeah strange few years amazing I don't want to kind of you know there was some amazing bits in that early stage but it was quite a bizarre thing because you do feel quite separate to everyone else in lots of ways but I think because my self-esteem was quite low I think that exacerbated making myself more separate than any than anyone else would have needed me to be or asked me to be and how did you deal with that mentally because going from arguably your lowest point or several very low points and you've talked really openly about how that impacted your mental health to then being thrown into the spotlight and being dubbed a guru and having your face known and your voice heard and and you're being seen by the public whilst feeling still quite other to your peers let's say that's a huge swing so how did you deal with that shift and that change mentally yeah I think not that well um and I think you know like being completely honest I remember Matthew and I talking about this so it's probably mid 2015 so our first book came out beginning of 2015 and that's when Delicious Yellow exploded and we went from people talking to me online big but niche online community to people talking about you and that was I think from a mindset perspective the biggest shift but with that was this realize you know people kind of would like walk past you sometimes and like point at you or like whisper to their friend and maybe they were saying something so nice like I cooked her recipe yesterday but I think because I wasn't in a great headspace I just assumed that they said oh, she looks really ugly or I really don't like her or you know whatever it was um I just assumed it was probably quite negative and you know I do I do remember Matthew saying he was completely right he was like you're kind of projecting this image of being really happy and like things going really well 
but the reality is like that that's not really how I felt and I felt so vulnerable and like I did have a period mid 2015 where I just felt this kind of really crippling sense of anxiety and I did have because at that point there was a get out jail free card it could have done something completely different still worked in the space but finished my training as a nutritionist and just worked with people one-on-one you know I didn't have to keep doing what we do now and I think in a way now there's no getting off the hamster wheel I love the hamster wheel now but there's there's a way in lots of ways practically there's no there's no getting off it but um at that point there was and I think it was really understanding why am I doing this and I, I really did feel you know that sense of my life had felt so bad for what at the time felt like such a long period really I was lucky it actually wasn't in in the grand scheme of things but I just felt if I could ever make someone else not feel this way or I could ever make someone else feel a little bit better then it doesn't really matter how I feel and I I don't say that to sound kind of like holier than thou I'm like a deeply flawed and imperfect person but I think just because I never want anyone else to go through anything like that if they don't have to that sense of drive has always been so deep in me that I think I kind of parked my mental well-being has improved but not quite where it needed to be for quite a long time and then because work was so intense it was kind of like there wasn't really space to figure anything else out so when did that shift come again because I I feel like actually the last year you have been prioritizing yourself Mm. At, at arguably probably your busiest time you run a very successful business you have two very young kids but I know you said the other day you feel better and, and feel the best you felt in a long time. So when was that shift from that sort of 2015, 2016 period where almost your mental mental health and mental state took a back seat for the mission? Mm. When did you then switch that to start really focusing on yourself again? Yeah, honestly, only so recently. So I, um, and look, I felt like I was doing really well in some ways as, as I said, I knew there were bits of me that weren't, but I think because my physical health was so much better and that had been the, like, clearly the dire bit, like the most obviously dire bit, and I didn't feel the depths of mental challenges that I did when I was really poorly, I kind of felt like I was okay and like stuck a really big plaster on it, could keep going. I was so excited about what we were doing, kind of that adrenaline, like really, really pushes you through. Um, and then we yeah it we were kind of getting through and, and figuring it things out and the business felt like it was coming together and then this was then spring 2017 and we we did think that like we might go bust around around that time again and that's just normal part of starting a business you know you're always going to have those challenges but we just raised money and to and it was really helping cash flow and we were like this is it like the last few years have been tough and now we're on the up and it was just such a great lesson the fact that like you never know what's coming in life you just got to enjoy every single day where you've got it because I was then in the US and I was on a really exciting trip all about promoting the book and the brand over there god and I was sorry I feel feel really good I I feel really emotional about this but I was in a um a meeting in our publisher's office in New York and and someone came into the meeting and they were like oh um uh you've had a family emergency um need to need to get out you because I hadn't taken any calls I was in this really big meeting anyway so I was trying to call Matthew and I was trying to call Matthew and obviously couldn't get through to him so I was having like a full-on heart attack and it was that his mum had had these massive seizures and she'd been rushed to hospital and um anyway and then over the next few days we found out that she um had terminal brain cancer and so the next that year was just like you know for, for Matthew and his his family just like living hell watching her deteriorate every single weekend and we spent like every single weekend with his parents we used to like spend every second that we could with them but again obviously priorities you know I was fine um and I needed to help him in any way that I could but I was also such a baby you know like didn't really have the emotional capability you know, it's almost impossible to help anyone through such a difficult time in their life, but I certainly didn't feel like I had all the skill sets I could want to help him through that. And then um, I took a month off actually the next summer. Um, we both took quite a, like a 
that August off, I did my yoga teacher training. And I remember on the last day of the training, so it's now 2018, it's like a closing ceremony. And everyone else was really happy. And like, we'd done it, what an amazing achievement. And I was bawling my eyes out. And I was like, I don't wanna go back to life. Like I, I felt, I don't know, it, was, it had would been amazing like having a second to kind of think about everything that had happened. Yeah. And then I got pregnant, like <laughs> six weeks later. So I said, we've lived on like times 30 mode for so long. And and then when Sky was born, nine months later, I went back to work within a month. And I don't say that to be really proud of it. It was probably not like the best thing to do from a mental health perspective, but I had been, I'd committed to so many things. I'd committed to a cookbook and I had such bad morning sickness. Couldn't develop any of the recipes when I was pregnant because I actually literally couldn't even look at a vegetable without gagging. And um, she's quite ironic when it's your yeah, job. I was just thinking that. Wow, yeah, God. exactly. And um, yeah, I literally only ate chips and um, crisps and roast potatoes for about four months. Um, anyway, and so, and I was like, try, oh my God, I remember I was being on set with her and she's like six weeks old and I was breastfeeding and I was like, I've got this. And I don't think I realized that I really didn't have it. And I think the last few years of kind of putting everything on the back burner and just like pushing through because I needed to, for whatever reason, had really come to kind of a head. And I did, I don't think, I didn't really know it at the time, but I had, I think really bad postpartum anxiety. I was just really, um, fixated on the fact that like something could go wrong so we started like whenever I'd be carrying her I'd be just walking down the stairs and I'd be like I'm gonna drop her what's gonna happen what happens if I drop her why I've never fallen down the stairs Mm -hmm. you know I'd be in the bath and be like I'm gonna drop her like logical rational mind it's like okay even if you did you'd pick her up Mm -hmm. but I was um I don't know I was kind of so scared or you'd be like waiting to cross the road and I'd be like I'm gonna let go of the buggy not not that trying to let go of the buggy but I think also you know, there's such a stigma around sometimes talking about these things. I thought people would think that I was like really crazy. And it wasn't that I wanted to do any of these things, not not in any shape or form. It's just, I was really aware that these things could happen. You could fall down the stairs, you could trip, you could this, you could that. And my mind was just like playing it out. You know, I'd like go and make sure like all the switches were turned off in the kitchen because, um, you know, set fire to the house. Like it was really just like quite, obsessive nervousness of anything that could go wrong and then lockdown happened such an important sorry to interrupt no. you but I think it's that's such an important conversation to have I think not enough is spoken about that postpartum period I think we're, we're just starting to talk about postpartum depression and what that means what that looks like yeah. but actually no one talks about if you're not quite at depression but there's anxiety and what that looks like and what's a normal level of anxiety versus what's a heightened level of anxiety that you know, you could look into further or seek help for that there aren't the conversations being had around that so I think it's a really important point that you bring up as and as a working mother as well you know it, it there's a lot going on there you've got a very full plate so it's yeah and I think I just put too much pressure on myself to be honest um and again I felt like I needed to fulfill a lot of things to do what I needed to do in a way in a way for everyone else, in a way for me. And I um, and I think I think also because I didn't feel low, I didn't, and I was really lucky with that, mm-hmm. you know, even like the first few days after Sky was born, I, I didn't feel that way. You know, and I did have some help and I felt like I couldn't complain as a result that I just, and I was really nervous that people would think that I was a bit mad, you know, and so, I just didn't talk about it. I just like tried to ignore it and ignore it and like keep going and keep going. But I think like if I look back on it, I don't think I enjoyed any of those. I mean, she was amazing. Like you did enjoy parts of it because she's so sweet. Um, but I didn't. I didn't really enjoy it. I wasn't really that present. Um, I was kind of just trying to get through it. And I think that's really relatable for a lot of new mums as mm. well. And also what you mentioned earlier about just going from one thing to the next that's also hugely relatable I think obviously not everyone starts a business not everyone deals with um, a terminal illness within their close family not everyone has a child or will choose to have a child or have a child but actually everyone can relate to that feeling of okay mental well-being is put on the back burner because I'm focusing on the mission of the company or my family or my friends or whatever their situation may be I think it's a hugely relatable feeling to not prioritize yourself and to prioritize 
everyone else or everything else in your environment or around you I completely agree and I think also one of the big mistakes for a better word that I made is I think I also like didn't realize what small things could do you know that I felt like I had to have this massive overhaul and didn't have any capacity for that but actually probably like 10 minutes of meditation would have really helped and I could have found 10 minutes let's let's talk about that actually because we all know your journey with nutrition um, and plant-based living but what else have you incorporated into let's say your wellness toolkit yeah. over the years and what really works for you yeah so it was in um so lockdown then happened I know like when Sky was about seven months or so and obviously everyone stopped and I was also pregnant with May at this point and who's our second daughter and I think it was in that moment which was you know I was actually not busy at all Matthew was very busy managing the disaster of supply chains and you know the business and keeping it going and he was you know took a lot on in terms of that responsibility but I had been meant to be on like a big book tour and all those sorts of things and everything had been cancelled and so he suddenly had space and it was the first time in since 2015 since this all started that I'd had space but also I guess it was the first time as like an adult I had a minute to think about things and I, I know everyone found lockdown different but I think quite a lot of people felt the same that it was suddenly you had a moment to not rush as you were saying from one thing to the next thing to the next thing keep putting things on the back burner you actually had to confront it mm. and I think I had to confront the fact that in a way I'd been just like running and rushing and running and rushing and why was I doing that um, and what was I trying to achieve and I did this um, mindfulness based stress reduction course and I actually did it because I was doing my 500 hours of yoga teacher training at this point and it was one of the module options and I thought yeah I can do that from home that looks kind of interesting I always said oh I don't have time for meditation I don't have time for that I don't really need it what difference is it going to make um, it's like the best eight weeks of my life um, it was amazing it took me so deep and we were doing kind of 40 minutes plus a few extras of meditation every day and I'd never done anything like that before and it changed my whole life yeah Matthew started calling me like Ella 2.0 it's like unrecognizable and I suddenly realized there was this kind of whole other way of looking at wellness and way of looking at our well-being and way of taking care of ourselves that was equal if not more important in some ways than the broccoli and the spinach and things like that and it really shifted my whole focus and I think in a way it's kind of shifted facets of the company's focus as well you know said about the app earlier in terms of bringing all those different components into it and I think I just became you know when I talked to lots of people on the podcast about these sorts of things because I became so convinced in my own life but then also in all the research that this kind of quite one-dimensional view that we often had and that I'd certainly had almost at the beginning of the fact that like just what we eat or maybe just how we move our bodies is what's going to impact our health and that actually it was so much deeper than that so yeah that was 2020 so I guess it's been the last almost three years now of kind of taking that deeper and deeper and exploring lots of different facets of it um and I started seeing someone a few months ago actually which is a kind of therapy stroke kind of emotional work um because there were definitely some things from from my childhood that I really had just never felt I was in a good enough place to look at um so yeah it's been a kind of amazing few months I really feel yeah in a very very different place than I ever had before as you said and it's this idea that I think you can't control the external and I feel like the last 10 years has taught me that in spades um but you can control more of the internal than I think I ever wanted to tell myself that you could because that level of responsibility it's kind of appealing to put it on other people isn't it rather than always own it yourself absolutely we have so much more power than we realize I think to create change and and sustainable change as well exactly and and see each day so differently and you know in a way we've never been busier you know in a way we've never had more responsibility you know I said earlier like in 2015 if I wanted to leave I could have left and and now I can't you know like even if I didn't want to do this got to do it for a certain amount longer you know when we bought out our shareholders last year we took on you know a few million pounds worth of debt like it's not not doing this right now is not an option and it's not an option that I want because I love it I love it so deeply that's not changed but I think it's we have got a lot of responsibility there is a lot going on we've also got two children and yet I feel calmer than I ever 
have before and it is it's that kind of I guess it's the dedication to consistently looking after my mental well-being and putting all those tools in place and I you know it's something I really want to explore with all our guests this season actually is that I really convicted for a lot of people myself very much included happiness is something that is available to so many of us but it's also not something that always comes lightly or easily and certainly in my life it's not it's something that I feel and I've learned that whether I like it or not I think it's something that I'll always have to work on and putting those kind of daily tools in place creates this kind of infinite level of happiness that I've never felt in the last three decades ever like I never have felt like that um but when I don't do it I don't feel that way and you know I look at Matthew and he does like happiness comes really inherent to him even when he's so overwhelmed even when he's so stressed he finds it quite easy to be happy Mm. I need to meditate I need to do yoga I need to eat my vegetables and all you know go to bed early and all the rest of it like I maybe maybe I'm just very sensitive who knows what it is but when I do that I feel kind of like the world's the best thing it could ever be yeah I think it's an important point you make as well that there isn't a start and an end to wellness or health it's an evolving thing and a continuous thing that you learn and evolve as you need to and it's also not linear which is important as well I think to note but on that what are your daily or weekly non-negotiables that are your go-tos to maintain your health yeah no definitely and on the non-linear I think that's one of the most important points because I know when I started I was like I'm going to eat healthily for six months then I'm going to feel great and I'll go back to exactly where I was living before and like a I loved it so I didn't want to go back but b I realized that was not the case and that's the frustration and I guess obviously it's coming out in January when that narrative is rife like Mm. do the six-week diet 90 days of this like get a six pack tomorrow um do this two week course and everything will be completely different and that that's just not how it works for us like you've got to keep doing it and some days it will be difficult and you won't do it and you'll have periods where you do it you can go back to it and come you know but it's not going to be linear and it's going to be quite messy but ultimately there is no one thing you can do today or tomorrow or for the next six weeks and then you will be fixed and then you will be healed ultimately I think if you really want to feel great mentally and physically for most people it's something that's going to be a daily-ish thing and I think in terms of those daily-ish and I love daily-ish it came from a podcast guest which is the tools that you feel you do want to do most days because it makes such a big difference to your mental health to your physical health but equally the ish is just giving us all that grace that compassion on the fact that not every day goes to plan and that's okay you don't you're not doing it wrong if you don't do it every single day for me the biggest thing is actually um space for choir Mm -hmm. um so we and it really helps i think that we both do it but we get up um like an hour an hour and a half before the girls in the morning which is early it's like 5 30 to 6 o'clock um wow early birds early birds yeah and look we're lucky because we've got toddlers who sleep to 6 45 7 so we are really lucky i appreciate that but that hour is gold like it's absolutely gold and it's become like quite a non-negotiable for us both and we always do a meditation normally about 20 minutes and then i'll do another one if i feel like i need more um and then maybe do like 10 15 minutes of yoga sometimes literally just drink coffee silently or listen to nice music read the papers do sudoku my secret favorite activity um but do something just in like really quiet we don't really talk to each other massively and it's just like completely your space your time and i think because our life is really busy as it is for so many people um making sure you guarantee that quiet time and and within that that meditation for me that's huge like I'm obsessed with the um positive affirmation and do that every single day and like we'll cycle through a few different affirmations but it's it's amazing it's seven minutes long and at the end of it I'm like yes I feel so elevated I feel like such a different person so that is kind of that is number one and like the the biggest non-negotiable in my life I think the second thing for me is just learning the art of saying no I think that's it doesn't seem like the most obvious wellness tool but I guess it links to the first which is like actually making time for yourself you know I am quite a introverted person I really like quiet I really like space I love time to just like potter around the house and you know to cook and I love cooking I really do people always ask that do you still love cooking and I love it so much it's like having space for that so 
saying no to things if people want you to do it or you maybe should do it but actually like when you really kind of I was very inspired by all the conversations to our series about living your life according to your values like what really matters to you what really matters to me is saying goodnight to my girls every day and putting them into bed having time to just potter around the house like it makes me such a better mum. it makes me such a better wife makes me so much happier and therefore better at work and all the rest of it so yeah saying no and I think I say no to like 98% of things um because I just I just love being at home such a homebody and just having a really few close friends and then I think the third thing is it is still making time to cook you know I feel so different when I eat properly and I eat really healthily and I I think it's so easy to say oh I don't have time and eat toast and don't get me wrong 100% do that too but actually to like make a really quick stir fry or something like that also takes 10 minutes it can be done in one pan you can just have the simplest of ingredients um you could make hummus yourself and put it on the toast you know it's like Mm -hmm. And sometimes I go through periods where I forget that. And you're like, oh, I don't feel so good. I don't feel so energized. Obviously not. You're not eating what you need to eat. And so I think for me, it's like, yeah, teeny little things, like a little lunchbox at work. It makes all the difference. So yeah, I guess it's time for meditation and quiet, making space for me and not getting to the stage, which is how I live for so long, which is never having time to really figure out what you feel and what you actually need. And then making sure you do take the time to just, five ten minute meals but Mm. they just make the world of difference to how i feel yeah brilliant takeaways there's nothing there that's a complete life overhaul you're not leaving your job or going off and living on a beach somewhere secluded it's it's small everyday incremental things that that people can take away and do which is is important and that's how it becomes sustainable i think i totally agree and i think it's one of one of the things that sometimes we get wrong in the world of wellness and well-being is that we feel you've got to change your whole life to make a difference you've got to quit your job you've got to move to the beach you know live in Bali live the influencer life um you know and I think sometimes and I totally get it people going to look at this space and think it's not relatable I'm juggling so many different things I don't really have any time and you know everyone comes at it from a different place I can't sit here and say you do have time I don't know you and I, I appreciate that fully but equally I think when we start to stop, when we stop looking at it as changing everything and start looking at it as batch cooking a lentil bolognese and then eating some of the leftovers for lunch or making some hummus and chucking a roasted carrots in there that you've got left over from Sunday lunch to get a bit more vitamins, get a few more vitamins and minerals in there or doing five minutes of de-stress meditation because you're so overwhelmed. It's, it feels like it's a little bit simpler and remembering that it's daily-ish. Like you don't, have to be perfect not that perfect's even a quantifiable concept but Mm. just the small things every day it it does start to add up like I've not changed anything massive in my life I haven't kept up the 40 minutes of meditation that I did in the course but over the last few years the more I've done the tiny things the easier they become and the bigger impact they've had yeah and I think the fundamental part of that is you setting boundaries to allow yourself to do it and to give yourself the space as you've said you're number two which actually is the foundation of of everything else on top of that which totally. is so important and ultimately it's it's so easy to say I don't have time but oh and I, I do feel this very very strongly that life is made of chapters and you can't do everything in every chapter and if we try to we just burn ourselves out like you can't give everything to your career and everything to your family and everything to your friends and everything to you know investing in your own well-being you know all at the same time like it's it's just impossible like to to get up at 5 30 5 45 we go to bed at 9 30 which means that we probably go out one night a week if that or have friends over one night a week because our priority we love our work we love our kids like that's just the life cycle that we're in right now and maybe there'll be a time in 10 years time where socializing and living a kind of more a bigger life in that capacity is is part of it but there's no way that I could do my job well and which I love but there's no way to do it without sacrificing other things and I think that is I think this myth that we can have at all is like one of the worst things for our collective well-being yeah I've, I've absolutely couldn't agree more so talking of looking forward and that next chapter what does that next chapter look like for you it seems like 2022 has been a real year of looking inwards doing the work digging deep 
and it feels like you're almost kind of ready for this next step so what does that next step look like for you yeah I feel really excited about it I feel as you said 2022 was a big year of self-development and self-discovery and I do feel passionately I mentioned it in the introduction that I think you could kind of get on a hamster wheel of self-development where you can always better yourself but like I think you know when is a period where you you quite want to because you feel like it will give you a lot more to give to the people around you like improving my self-esteem means that if someone says something nasty to me or something I don't take it into the rest of the day or if you if you get a response from someone you weren't looking for that's okay you know someone doesn't want to come on the podcast that's okay I'm not a terrible person because of it and I think that was a great experience of self-development to improve self-esteem but I'm happy to kind of get off the self-development train this year in a way and just kind of really live and enjoy it I don't I don't want people to feel like you start self-development you've got to develop for the next how many years of your life because I actually think that starts to be quite depressing I think it's a fantastic tool in places but then use it to live and I think that's what I'm really excited about this year is I feel a confidence in myself that I've never felt before you know I don't mind what people think of me. I don't mind what people want to say. I don't think I would have felt confident to take the podcast in the direction that we are in the past. I would have felt too nervous to have someone sit opposite me and ask them these sorts of questions. And and now I can look at it and just say, look, I'm so lucky to get the opportunity to sit down with this person. Let's just kind of see what happens. Um, and I think I feel really excited. That sense of mission for Delicious Yellow is still have in droves it hasn't waned which I'm kind of surprised about in some ways um and I feel like this confidence allows it to kind of explode in some ways which I'm I'm really yeah I feel really excited about and also life is easier now that I don't have two under two like that's just (laughs) call a spade a spade it's quite a it was a it was such a juggle and you know when you're in it you don't always completely realize so I think it's going to be a a good year and I hope that through the conver- these sorts of conversations we can yeah as I said at the beginning and allow people to feel inspired and empowered and uplifted not to emulate someone or not to take their three kind of like bits of wellness their sort of daily wellness tools and say that's what I've got to do but just to see that there's different ways of looking at things and different ways to approach things and maybe there's facets of it that would be helpful to bring into your own life in some capacity in some way Mm. to coin Matt's term from earlier it sounds like Ella 2.0 is officially here yeah exciting I hope so I hope so yeah it's um it's exciting